Little known fact, believe it or not, in the strongest tornadoes, you may have seen pictures on TV of those big, huge tornadoes that do a lot of damage. Those are actually made up of multiple vortices. And those little vortices spinning around each other can do a, a ton of damage. Now onto some pictures. Here's um, some shots of my storm chasing crew. This was two years ago when we went storm chasing. A couple of my crewmates there. Um, a lot of the research companies like Texas Tech and Michigan will have actually storm chasing crews where they have a caravan of cars that are all set up with equipment. Anemometers, thermometers, barometers, all kinds of cool stuff to measure the storm. And they'll send these trucks in as close to the storm as they can possibly get without getting there. We'll spend years out in the field trying to find tornadoes. And it's not as easy as it looks. How many, guys have, how many of you have seen uh, Twister before, the movie Twister? Yeah, they make it look easy, right? It's like there's a tornado around every corner. I mean, it's not really like that. A lot of guys spend years and years and years out there looking for tornadoes. It's a giant area, the Midwest and the Plains. And to find the right spot at the right time is pretty tricky. Um, actually, let me uh, take a second here to dispel a few more Twister myths. Twister myth number one. Um, tornadoes on the radar that you can actually see them. Remember I showed you that radar shot before? And showed where the most likely area of a tornado is. Do you remember in the movie when they said, oh look, it's an F5 on the, on, the, on the radar. You can't actually tell how strong a tornado is on radar. It's just not possible. Myth number two, that tornadoes move in erratic directions and they can come back and hit you from turning around. That's actually a myth. Once a tornado establishes a path, it usually stays on that track until it dissipates. Myth number three, that tornadoes What's my myth number three? Um, let's see. That a tornado, well, all right, forget myth number three. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just go to my final myth. Myth number four, that you can actually survive an F5 tornado by tethering yourself to a pipe in the ground. <laughs> this is probably the biggest myth of all. The winds in an F5 tornado or as you saw in that other graphic, were over 200 miles an hour. So you're not going to survive a 200 mile an hour wind by tethering yourself to a pipe. So don't even get the idea that it's possible to survive something like that. And finally, this is my first tornado ever, and I was kind of excited. <laughs> Forgive me for the uh, Superman flexing my biceps picture, but I was sort of excited and I didn't exactly know what to do. But So, now that I've inspired all of you to become storm chasers and meteorologists in general, you're wondering, how do I study from here? Obviously, you, at your level, you can't take classes in meteorology in the schools you're in. So, a couple things to focus on. First, math and physics. These are obviously the two most important fields of study to go into. Um, if you don't like math and physics, I'm going to say meteorology is probably not for you. Math and physics really dominate what you're going to do in college. There's a lot of equations, there's a lot of algebra, calculus, but it's really not too hard as long as you have fun doing things like math and physics. Chemistry. Um, if any of you are interested in possibly going into the field like studying global warming or air pollution or climate change, something like that, chemistry is becoming more and more important every day. Economics, energy. Um, as you heard before, I have a degree in economics. And a lot of people say, economics, how does that tie into meteorology? Well, as I said before, a lot of these energy companies are now looking for meteorologists who have some sort of a background in either energy or economics. Um, if they have traders on the floor who are trading things like electricity or gas or crude oil, they want to talk to a meteorologist who understands how the market works. Finally, communications. Um, if you're thinking about going into broadcast meteorology, obviously communications, things like English, very important to um, be a good communicator in a field like that. But I can't, I can't um, underemphasize how important it is also in some field like what I do. For example, when that dispatcher calls me up, I have to tell him exactly what I'm thinking and what it's going to do, but I'm, I also have to be able to verbalize it and vocalize it. And I'm not, if I'm not able to do that, he's not going to understand it and there's going to be a breakdown in communication. So it's very important to be a good communicator no matter which field you go into. And finally, all done. So I guess I will take a few questions now. If you, um, before I take some questions, I just want to let you know that 
Upstairs, um, I will be set up at a table. So if you want to come and talk to me a little bit more about meteorology in general, I mean, there's a million diff different things I can talk to you about. If you're interested more about a career, I can talk to you about that. Also, I'll be with Danielle Niles, who's a broadcast meteorologist. So if you're interested in doing TV work as a meteorologist, she'll be up there with me as well. So you can ask her a few questions about what it's like um, doing TV weather. So questions? Yes? What motivated me? I don't know. I just kind of like thunderstorms. I mean, they're cool, right? You go outside and you look up at the sky and you see this unbelievable thunderstorms. I think another reason, too, is not thunderstorms, but, um, for example, in the wintertime, you know, we all want snow days, right? That's kind of what we're all looking for during the winter. I would sort of, I, as I was growing up, I sort of got interested in snow and ice storms, so teachers would ask me what the weather was, and I tried to do a little forecasting on my own. And I guess it's a lot easier for you guys to do something like that nowadays because you have the internet. Of course, back when I was a kid, I didn't really have the internet, so I had to do things like forecast, you know, using things like a weather radio. But now you have the internet, so it's very easy for you guys to go out and do some of the forecasting on your own. Yes? Dust storms. Well, obviously, the dust storms really aren't important so much in the U.S., but um, there are a lot of meteorologists, especially in the military, who will forecast for, for places like Iraq and battlefields, and dust storms are very important in the Middle East. Um, but yes, dust storms, especially back in the 1930s and 1940s, obviously, in the plains were very important. Um, if you got a really strong cold front to come down through the plain states, it could really turn up the wind. And back then, there wasn't a lot of grass like we have now, so it would kick up a lot of dust. But it's become less important, at least in the U.S., because um, farming practices have become a lot better at not just wiping out entire Great Plains worth of grassland. Anybody else? Yes? What's my favorite kind of storm? Other than a thunderstorm? Um, I'd have to say a blizzard. Blizzards are pretty cool, too. How far would you typically drive like, to find this area, or how long does this storm chase take? Oh, uh, the storm chase day is a long day. We can drive several hundred miles in a day. Now, we want to put ourselves in the best position when we start, so maybe we might start out in Kansas, and we decide that the best looking spot for the tornadoes that day is going to be up in Nebraska. So we might have to drive 300 miles to get into position that day. And then when we get up there, all the storms might be developing out in South Dakota. So now we have to drive another couple of hundred miles. And in an average day, we can drive up to four, five, six hundred miles, no problem. So if you don't like driving, I wouldn't recommend storm chasing. But um, it can be worth it once you get there. It's a lot of fun. Yes? Yes, you got that right. Um, batting average for tornadoes, it's pretty low. I, for, for storms in general, it's high. When you go storm chasing, you're, you gotta, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to see some really cool stuff. Not necessarily tornadoes, but a thunderstorm almost every day, I would say. Maybe 80 to 90% of the days that you're out there, you'll see a very intense thunderstorm. Out of those, maybe 10% will produce a tornado. And most of the time, you'll spend sitting there saying, please make a tornado, please make a tornado. But they don't always drop down. Anybody else? Yes? I've seen three. When I first started, I was in college. So that would have been right around 21, 22, which was about 10 years ago. The watch is issued a long time before the warning. The watch is issued sort of earlier in the day, and it covers a very broad area. And it's usually forecasters who say the conditions are sort of favorable for development of severe thunderstorms anywhere in this particular area. So it could cover several hundred square miles. A warning is much more specific. A warning means that a tornado is imminent. It's like when I showed you that slide earlier of the hook echo with the thunderstorm. 